thank you very much for your precise pronunciation in, even in German of this very, very difficult title of an institution. In English, it would be something like Institute for Frontier Areas of Psychology and Mental Health. Mental Health is something that we have a counseling department, which is not doing real research. Yeah, I go to this one. <laughs> Thank you again very much, Professor Lara, and also Master uh, Tashi for your kind invitation to come here and speak at this very, very interesting meeting. I mean, I anticipate it will be very interesting, and I only heard the first talk, which increases my hope that this will become real true. <laughs> now, um, I want to talk about the process of creative activity, or of insight, as we sometimes call it as well, that scientists sometimes experience. Sometimes, uh, I'm saying because, of course, we don't have insights every day. Sometimes we have to work hard over days and weeks, sometimes months, sometimes even years, as I will show you some examples of. And, but once in a while, we have these moments which are like drugs in the life of the scientist when we suddenly understand something for the first time. Even if someone else has understood it already. So, for instance, if you read the proof in the mathematical textbook, which extends over pages and pages, and we make the logical steps from one to two to three and so on, and at some point we get the grand picture, and that's the moment of insight. Then we have understood, in some sense, what the proof is about. This is what some people also call the so-called aha experience. Aha, now I see. And this is what I want to talk about and from this very brief and superficial if you want, outline. You can already see that, you can already sense maybe that. Um, I will not talk about rigorous uh, theoretical approaches and I will not talk about sound empirical facts because these things are simply not there at the moment. There's a long history of um, research into what people nowadays call inside problem solving. Um, but there are many theories, competing theories, and I think there is no final word spoken yet. So um, I want to, rather than talking about results and theories, I want to try to give you some ideas and maybe frameworks of thinking, uh, which I, uh, during my occupation with the topic, have found inspiring and stimulating, and of course you are free to disagree. So also, uh, if, if there are issues which come up during the talk um, which need more explanation than I am giving at the moment, please also feel free to interrupt me any moment and uh, ask questions if you want. Now, let me start with a brief overview. I will have a, a short introduction, which gives a little bit of a historical background from which I will start and address the question of scientific creativity. Then I will have something to say about creative activity and insight, mainly from a phenomenological level, that is from essentially from biographical narratives of some people who claim to have had insights. You will see this is already interesting to some extent. Of course, I again emphasize that this, of course, is not an explanation or a theory about what goes on um, in these phases of creativity. Uh, then I will address um, some ideas which uh, Jung, Master uh, Tasha Gretchen Jung already, Jung had in, in his long exchange of ideas with Wolfgang Pauli. This is a chapter in the history of science which is still not very well known. Uh, Pauli and Jung had intense, almost cooperation. They also published a book together um, over almost three decades. And the idea in this cooperation, in these discussions, I should say, was to find a kind of common framework for Jung's analytical psychology, depth psychology, and uh, Pauli's 
viewpoints on theoretical physics. And this, of course, ends up being, uh, in some sense, a chapter in natural, natural philosophy and metaphysics, something like that. So this is probably very close to what Masatoshi already addressed in his talk and maybe uh, amplifies on this here and there. And um, also these ideas by Newman Pauli will lead us to some, I think, quite interesting questions which can be addressed in, in, strong, in, in strictly scientific terms, partly have been addressed already, uh, and um, this will be more or less what I will talk about at the end, and then give some summary perspectives, literature, and so on. So this is the first part of the introduction. <coughs> The title, I, you have noticed, I rephrased the title a, bit, a little bit to condense it. Uh, context of discovery, what does that mean? So the, the historical background of this notion and also the delineation of context of discovery from context of justification is due to a famous philosopher of science, also a physicist, Hans Reichenbach, offspring of the Vienna School, uh, which was founded by Moritz Schlick and more or less was based on the ideas of Ernst Bach, the positivist and empiricist ideas of Ernst Bach. Reichenbach soon went to Chicago, and already in his, in his Chicago period, 1938, he published a book in which he made a distinction between these two different contexts under which you can see scientific work. According to Reichenbach, every scientist, I have written this down here just uh, to, to really give you a very brief and condensed version of it. Every scientist is, of course, exposed to psychological, social, and cultural circumstances, which may or even play a role when he discovers new results, empirically or theoretically or whatever. But the legitimacy or, or the validity of these results can neither be justified nor rejected by such contexts of discovery. So the way in which someone reaches his results cannot be made responsible for the validity or cannot be used to justify the legitimacy of these results. This, is, this was the opinion of Reichenbach. And he suggested something different. Uh, if you are trying to investigate the legitimacy question, you have to uh, investigate something he called the context of justification. And that is essentially, and here you see that he is really belonging to the Vienna School, you have to look for the rational reconstruction of the result, which is, in, 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 which is essentially in the sciences, is essentially uh, mathematical and logical deductions that lead to that result from a starting point which is considered to be part of the accepted knowledge at the time. A very nice example of this is a quotation by Hamilton Helmholtz, a physicist in the 19th century, and he said explicitly in my publications, I did of course not entertain the reader with my aberrations, that is, with the context of discovery, but only described the paved way to him along which he can now effortlessly reach the summit. So this is the way in which everybody can reconstruct and follow, and, and you don't have, have to go through all the different pathways to, to, into the into the one ways and so on, you can just straight go to the result. This is, um, I think, a very nice and compact characterization of this clash between these two contexts. And, you know, the, the position of Hamilton, Hamilton Helmholtz was, of course, the position uh, of many scientists all the time, with, with only a few exceptions. Now, the situation um, started to change a little bit in the 1970s and 80s. Thomas Hankins is, I think, one of the pioneers in the history of science in that respect. And here's a quotation by, by Hankins of 1979. We can say at least one thing with certainty about biography. The ideas and opinions expressed by our subject came from a single mind and are integrated to the extent that that person was able to integrate them in his or her own thoughts. Science is created by individuals, and however much it may be driven by forces from outside, these forces work through the scientist himself. 
Biography is the literary lens through which we can best view this process. Letters written under great emotional stress are the best grist for the biographer's mill because they lead straight to the heart of the subject's personality and reveal the ground springs from which his actions come. Um, not much to add. Uh, I have given you some references here which cover actually almost precisely the last century. There's a lot of biographical material uh, which has been collected by Poulain, a French historian of science, Wallace, George Wallace, um, Jacques Adamal, a French mathematician, Dean Simonton, he's at uh, the University of California, Davis, Arthur Miller, now at London, and of course this is only a very short and selected list. Another uh, present-day historian science, put it in different words, he says, the still neglected chapter in history of science literature is the integration of psychological factors, which Stefan Zweig has demonstrated in his historical portraits, for a complete description of the forces shaping individuals and hence their scientific work. Their psychological conditionality would have to be included together with internal scientific constraints and social or you could also say some social cultural boundary conditions. Since in most cases access to the necessary source material is restricted by a screened private sphere, such an enterprise can only be carried out under exceptional circumstances. Now, uh, these exceptional circumstances can be found in selected biographies, and here I have given you some names like the Diaries of Carl Friedrich Gauss, very good example in which he, you know, wrote down the way in which he dealt with his material, theorems and so on, over the years. Also his correspondence with friends like the astronomer Olivers. It's very um, interesting in that respect. Kyle Mollis, I already gave you a quote. Paul Carré, very important, and Einstein, also very important. We have a lot of material from these two. Mainly, I have to say, based on on what people now often call introspection. And this is, of course, another problem in this kind of uh, excess introspection is a methodology which is always based on subject, subjective experience alone. And it is very difficult to um, draw consequences from it if you want to do objective science, of course. And this, this is a relevant problem. Uh, Paul Dirac, and um, of course there's a huge amount of material available now from Wolfgang Pauli because his uh, full correspondence is now published in eight volumes, 8,000 pages. This is the work by this person here, Carl from Mayen. Now, so this is in some sense a little bit of a background. You can see uh, that this focus on context of discovery of what people really experienced, what they did, under which influences they were, that they, that they discovered new results when they had these big insights, um, which most of us never will have, including myself, of course. But if you look at these names, of course, that these, this is it's clear that they are known for extremely important achievements in science. And that also is one of the reasons why their insights, at least from a, from a history of science point of view, um, have been discussed most. Now, um, based on all this material, already Polar and Wallace set up some kind of phenomenological taxonomy, uh, which I will show you in the next few graph. And this taxonomy consists of four different stages. Some of you may have seen that already. Uh, the first stage, or the first phase, um, which these people have distinguished, is the preparation phase. And uh, the preparation phase consists of um, what, for instance, Paul Carré described as days of voluntary effort, which have appeared absolutely fruitless. Uh, and this is something which all these sources claim to be necessary preconditions for insight. So you need to do this kind of um, effortless, fruitless work for a while. Sometimes this takes even years. I have a quotation here from 
This is Carl Ludwig Gauss, the mathematician. And this is presented from a letter to his friend Albers. You know the, uh, the products of Albers. And Gauss writes, and you may remember my earlier worries, worries about the theorem, which I then knew for more than two years, and which resisted all my efforts to find a sufficient, sufficient proof. This is also an interesting point, because he knew the theorem already. This is, a, this is a kind of methodology which happens sometimes, particularly in mathematics, that you know what you want to prove, but you don't know how to do it. It's interesting. This distressed me even in the presence of all other results I found, and for four years, this is now period, four years, for four years there was rarely a week in which I didn't try to untangle this knot, particularly intensely more recently. But all reading, all seeking was in vain, and sadly, I had to put away my pen each time. Eventually, a few days ago, I succeeded, not due to my previous efforts, but due to God's grace, I'd like to say. In a flash, the riddle was solved. I would not be able to identify the link between what I knew before, what I used in my most recent attempts, and what led me to the final success. Four years, this is quite a time. Do you agree? The next step in this series is the, what people call incubation. And incubation is uh, characterized in the following way. The preceding work, the preparational work, sets the unconscious machinery uh, going at work. Um, unconscious is the key issue here. Of course, this is again a matter of debate. Uh, how can one consciously know, or how can be aware that something goes on unconsciously? Uh, this is again, this boils down to the, to the, to the whole problem area of introspection, of course. So Poincaré, for instance, reports uh, the following. He says, he said, unconscious element rose in crowds. I felt them collide. How does he do it? I don't know, but I mean, this seems to be a kind of observation which he made over and over. And uh, this is only one of the many quotes that we can find uh, in, his, in his writings. Similarly, Einstein uh, said, this combinatorial play seems to be the essential feature in creative work. And of course, I will come back to that. Then the third stage would be the stage which has been called illumination. That's the actual moment in which the insight appears, the high experience comes up. And again, Poincaré pairs of these unconscious elements interlock, making a stable combination. Notice that this has a stable combination. This configuration of this combination is experienced as the sudden and unexpected formation of a new idea and a high experience of insight, which is very often not unfolded at the time. So the insight comes in some sense as a whole, and it's not, it is not yet sequentialized in logical steps or something like that. And that's the reason why there is step four, the verification step, uh, the insight needs to be reconstructed. Now, in other words, it has to be brought into a context of justification. This is the issue here. It needs to be reconstructed by a succession of rational arguments which can be communicated. Of course, the context of justification is also the context under which scientists will be able to communicate what they found. It is not enough to say, I had a convincing dream but you need to be able to communicate it step by step. And here's another quote by Einstein. Conventional words or signs have to be sought for laboriously. This is something which can again take a long time. So when you have this flash of insight, then the real work, in some sense, only comes. Let me uh, also give you one quote for this. for this um, holistic as it were, appearance of this insight. This is from a, it's not from a scientist, this is from a Swiss novelist, Max Frisch. And Frisch, in his diaries, wrote about many topics. And he was also very interested in the issue of time, as, as we all are, in a sense. But he has a kind of interesting attitude toward time, which has a lot to do with this um, 
holistic versus unfolded um, appearance of insight. Time, it would be just a magic tool unfolding and making visible our essence by disentangling life, the omnipresence of all possibilities into successive stages. Only therefore it seems like a transformation to us, I'm sorry for this, and therefore it urges us to assume that time, the successive, is not essential but apparent, an ancillary tool, an unwind that shows us in succession what actually is interleaved, a simultaneity which we cannot perceive as such, as we cannot perceive the colors of light when its rays are not refracted and spectrally decomposed. So, um, he, he introduces kind of, he introduces time as a kind of parameterization of something which is originally holistic in some sense, and compares it with the spectrum. I mean, this, this, if you have spectral wavelengths, of course, this is also can be considered as a parameterization parameter along which it decompose um, when this is an electromagnetic spectrum. So this is an interesting idea in, in, in terms of what I said before. The step from illumination to verification is precisely the arrangement of the holistic insight along an axis, for instance, in this case, the time axis, or an axis of logical steps or something like that. Yes? <coughs> So, do you think that preparation and incubations are necessary and uh, essential to get the illumination? Um, that's what these people claim. Exactly. What do you think about it? Um, you know, I'm not in a position to compare myself with all these names, but <laughs> these, these little experiences which, which maybe all of us have once in a while, I think my, my point of view would be that I can follow this. Note that in these four stages, stage one and stage four is of course very overt. It's something which which can be it's it's something which, which happens in, in conscious activity. It's all it's all a matter of awareness, aware of thought. Whereas um, steps two and three, the incubation and the illumination step, this is in this picture something which goes on without really it's not controlled consciously, it's not controlled by our cognitive activities. I'm always talking in this picture. Of course, it can be criticized, it should be criticized constructively. Um, now, uh, there's a long history, as you all know, and you know better than I, uh, about research on these topics, and I think it is not really unfair to say that this history started with the uh, Gestalt psychologists in the early 20th century. Of course, there were ideas here and there before, but the first systematic approach, I think, was Italian Gestalt psychology um, with Wertheim, Mandoka, and Lucin. Then, um, when cognitivism and cognitive science came up, people like Newell and Simon, uh, they suggested to investigate something like search strategies in problem space, the kind of cognitive space which, in which the problem can be formulated that you are trying to solve. Um, then another approach which is more recent, the so-called representational change approach. Knopf um, and is one of the um, pioneers, if you want, Jones and Olson. And this is, um, for instance, put into the laboratory by um, what we know as these matchstick arithmetic problems. So if you have an equation, if you formulate the equation 4 plus 4 equals 4 in terms of matchsticks and Roman numbers, you know what I mean? 4 in Roman numbers plus 4 in Roman numbers equal 4. Then the, the task is, uh, for instance, to change one of the matchsticks and make it the correct equation. And what people usually do is they try to change the numbers in the first step. The representational change means that you have to change your mindset in order to go from the numbers to the symbols, to the symbols of operations. And then you easily find the solution just by changing the plus. Change the ver take the vertical matchstick and the plus and arrange it horizontally, then you have the equation side, and then 
the equation simply is 4 equal 4 equal 4. So this, is, this would be the solution. But it's not, if you are, if you are fixed on the, on the change of the numbers, it's not easy to find. So you change the representation. And that can, you can do a lot of interesting research with this kind of um, studies. But of course, you see it at, the, um, at, the, at this very moment that uh, this kind of studies is very, very remote from insights that people like Einstein, von Curry, and Gauss have. So this, this, it's, a, it's a necessary step to start there, but there's a huge gap to the insights which we uh, see in the biographies and the historical descriptions. And of course, more, most recently, uh, search for neural parlance, that's what people do in any of these fields. So I'm linked here. Uh, I want to address, um, let me, let me make one remark with respect to these, or two remarks. There's a very nice um, overview over this history by an article by Knopic and Erlinger, which has just been published. I can give it to you at the end as a reference. And also, I should say that all these approaches really focus more or less on what goes on in cognitive activity. This is not, there's not, no, nothing about the unconscious or something here. So this is, um, but mainstream science actually deals with is our attempts to describe these moments of insight, these are my experience, in terms of cognitive to the unconscious. Now, um, there's this one approach by Dean Simmons, which I mentioned not because I, I like it extremely much, but it's so far, as I can see, one of the very, very few uh, that. Um, try to address also these phases two and three, the incubation and the illumination phase. Uh, and, and he tries to address them in terms of the activity of the unconscious, whatever that is. We will come to that, to that, come back to that in a minute. So what he says is um, that existing categories or existing connections in, in the problem space are de destabilized by this preparational work. And uh, this destabilization initiates and maintains the incubation phase in which these unconscious elements permute and combine involuntarily, of course involuntarily because there is no conscious control. And this is the chance component in this model. This model he called the chance configuration model. And the issue of configuration comes here. Very close to the description of Paul Curry, he says that the stability properties of particular unconscious configurations of elements imply that these configurations become conscious. And so the, the, the fact that certain configurations become stable implies, or is in some sense equivalent, with their becoming conscious. That's the elimination. And of course, in this kind of excess, in this approach, I should say, stability becomes a, more or less something like a criterion for the selection um, of one among many chance configurations. And that's why we you know that we have this kind of interplay between selection and chance. And that's the reason why he calls this model the Darwinian model. That's that's uh, so terminology. Now, of course, what he does not explain and he doesn't even address it in detail. How is the stability established, or what are the what are possible mechanisms or possible uh, ideas behind this emerging stability of just one among many possible configurations of these elements? Harold, Harold, uh, you mentioned uh, the first phrase, "stabilization yeah. occurs by chance." Is there any deterministic uh, uh, view in addition? To in in Simmons' uh, framework, no. There is no determinism at that level. I mean, if you are, if you are back in, in your state space, conscious states, cognitive states, of course, then you can, you can, you may be able to find deterministic rules. But this is really, he, he means to say that this is purely by chance. I'll give you a literature about that at the end. Now, at this point, um, I have a quote here which goes more or less precisely, I would say, in the same direction. This is something 
uh, which Wolfgang Pauli um, worked out in more detail in a famous article, which is among the specialists, it's called the Kepler article. It's about the influence of archetypes in the formation of scientific theories uh, of Kepler. It's published in 1952. And the, the, the passage which I want to quote for you here is the following. You can see it's very, uh, very close to what um, Simonton has in mind. The process of understanding nature as well as the blissful experience in this process when a new insight becomes conscious seems to be based on a correspondence, a kind of congruence of inner images in the human psyche with external objects and their behavior. At this point, it seems most satisfactory to me, and now it really becomes metaphysical, to introduce the postulate of a cosmic order, eluding our direct access, which is distinct from the world of appearances. The relation between sensual perceptions and ideas would then follow from the fact that both the soul of the observer and the observed object are governed by the same objective order. Uh, now, this is clearly metaphysical because it's, he says himself, eluding our direct access, so this is not an object of empirical um, methodology anymore. But um, metaphysics is not necessarily only about physics. Sometimes it also provides interesting frameworks, frameworks of, of guiding our intuitions and um, bringing up new ideas. And this is what I mentioned in the beginning. This is what I want to essentially wanted to, to bring to you in this talk. Now, um, I would like to elaborate a little bit more on this idea before I come to the conclusions. And this means elaborating on this idea needs to present to you very, in a very compact, it's more or less like a cartoon if you want, uh, in a cartoon, uh, the basic scheme which Pauli together with Jung came up with in order to um, make this kind of contact between uh, Jung's psychology and Pauli's knowledge of, of theoretical physics. So you see in this, in this cartoon, on the upper half you see two different sectors, if you want, two domains. One of them refers to physics on the right-hand side, the material domain. And um, in the material domain, the objects of study, of course, are objects of physical systems also, of chemical, biological systems, including neurobiology. And on the left-hand side, you have a sector which is here called the mental domain, or you would call it the psyche, objects in awareness or in consciousness. This is something which does not include the unconscious, of course. So you will see that there is a certain kind, you see that there is a certain kind of dualism, but of course it's not Cartesian, because there are not, I will explain that in a minute, there are no direct interactions between these two domains, according to Pauli. The way in which the domains correspond to each other, or can be made to correspond to each other, is introduced by a, by a speculative um, third domain, which shows the lower half of this cartoon. And from, from the Jungian viewpoint, this lower half um, has to do with the collective, what he called the collective unconscious, archetypes, and so on. And from the physical uh, way of thinking, it is what people nowadays, even in, in mainstream physics, call this but the list of quantum reality, if we're about PR correlations and stuff like that. So in uh, this domain of physical description, there are no a priori objects, but there are only systems as a whole. And just going from this holistic quantum reality to the material domain, individual objects, it gives you empirical access to those objects. This is what people nowadays call the process. And, and interestingly, we can uh, introduce something which is parallel to this process of physical measurement. On the left-hand side, uh, between the unconscious and the conscious, and that's the process of becoming conscious. So uh, let me again give you a quote by Pauli, which says this in better words than I can do. 
uh, the ordinary characters, that's the archetypes in this picture, must be considered beyond the distinction of physical and psychical, as Plato's ideas share the character of a notion with that of a natural force. I am very much in favor, says Pauli, of calling these ordinary factors archetypes, but then it would be inadmissible to define them as contents of the psyche. This was, as some of you may know, something which Jung actually did in, in his earlier work on archetypes, he defined them as contents of the psyche, and this is what Pauli criticizes here for, for good systematic reasons. If the archetypes are ordering factors for the psyche and for, the, for, and for matter, then they cannot be parts of the psyche they have to be outside. Instead, the inner images are psychic manifestations of the archetypes, which, however, also would have to create, produce, and cause everything in the material world that happens according to the laws of nature. The laws of the material world would thus refer to the physical manifestations of the archetypes. Each natural law should then have an inner correspondence and vice versa, even if this is not always immediately visible today, writes Pauli to his colleague Marcus Fierz, another uh, theoretical physicist, in 1948. So you see this picture here, the lower, the lower half of this cartoon uh, is the domain in which Pauli would claim that there are these kind of ordinary factors, and they have influence on both the material and the mental domain at the same time. Now, in the philosophy of mind, this, this kind of approach fits very well what people now discuss as a dual aspect approach, and it has, of course, uh, a very interesting component because uh, it, un it unifies the picture of a kind of neutral monism as um, Russell would have called it, but the kind of dualistic, epistemic, epistemically dualistic picture. So you have, you have the best of both if you want. You have the dualism which separates the mental and the material, but this is not considered to be an ontological feature, as in Descartes, but it's simply called as two different perspectives on the same. Considered two different perspectives on the same, and this same is um, this kind of neutral, monistic, psychophysically neutral, I could also say, domain. Actually, this is also a kind of identity theory, which is a lot discussed in, in the philosophy of mind and the talk of science. But it's not an identity theory which reduces the matter to the material, and therefore makes everything identical. But it's an identity theory, identity theory more in the sense of, of Herbert Feigl, who, who coined the notion of central states, which again are, are looked at from different perspectives, uh, like from the mental, from the psychological, and, and from the material, from the physical. So, uh, in principle, I would think this is a very uh, viable perspective. Of course, the problem that you buy when you when you talk about this is that you that you speculate about or you you, you posit kind of unified theory. This um, neutral monism, which you have no idea whatsoever how it, how it is to be described. It's just, a, it's just an X. It's an unknown. Um, one other feature which is sort of attractive in this picture is that, you know, simply by assuming it, you have automatically correlations between the mental and the material. And these correlations are very well known to all of us. We are about neural correlates of consciousness or neural correlates of mental states, because we use the fact, the alleged fact, that there are correlations between uh, psychology and physiology. Although, if you look into the literature, you can find a lot of research about uh, physiological and psychological in themselves, but really specify the correlations in detail is a topic which is not, which is not much work on. So, it's a kind of if you want a blind spot or a white spot on the map. And uh, this kind of approach gives you a very elegant feature with all the problems that it has. But it has gives you an elegant um, explanation, systematic explanation of correlations between the mental and the material. In the 
terminology of Paulian film, these correlations were called synchronicities. And synchronicity, the notion, of course, has a, in science, has a very bad press um, because it, film discussed very mysterious things about uh, in terms of synchronicities. Um, I should just very briefly give you a characterization of what, what Jung and Pauli suggested as synchronicities in the sense of these mind matter correlations. And this is, of course, not taken from Pauli or Jung's writings, it's just a condensed uh, definition which I, which I worked on myself. So uh, it's like this two or more seemingly accidental or uh, accidental, not necessarily simultaneous events are called synchronistic if the following three conditions are satisfied. First of all, any presumption of an efficient causation between the events is absurd or even inconceivable. So there is no direct causal relation between these events, like mental material. There's no mental causation, for instance. And there's no material causation on the mental also. Then, then this is what Jung insisted on. The events correspond with one another by a common meaning. And the third point, of course, here, each pair of synchronistic events comprises an internal mental component and a material component. So it's always a relationship correlation between the mental and the material. Now, there, Paul and Jung had, of course, two totally different um, frameworks of thinking how to address these issues and work on, on which properties of these synchronistic events to focus. So Jung uh, was very fascinated with this issue of symbolic meaning, as you can tell from his psychoanalysis and so on, occupation. Uh, so he would say the key to synchronicity is the concept of meaning and blind chance, which of course can also be there if you have um, two different events which happen at the same time. So that would be the limiting case of this negative significance. Whereas Paul, he actually tried to go the other way around to try to understand um, more precisely what chance is about. This is, of course, a question in science um, which you run into you know, in many different fields, also in physics, also in biology and so on. How can chance be understood? Is it a deviation from determinism? Is chance something which is left over when everything else is deterministically explained? Or how does chance, or is chance something which is there primordially, as some quantum mechanical uh, interpretations suggest? This is this is all open ground. This is open to discussion. So um, let me show you two different interesting viewpoints which Pauli addressed. And the first one is on statistics. He says synchronistic phenomena defy being captured by natural laws because they are not reproducible. They are unique and smeared out by the statistics of large numbers. You know, whenever we do statistics in, in scientific work, of course, we rely on, on limit theorems, statistics. And one of these limit theorems is the law of large numbers, and we have the central limit theorem. And what he says here is that there is a class of events which he, which he seems to be convinced of that they exist, which which cannot be captured by laws of large numbers. And of course, this is something which is, um, this is a situation which is very unusual for scientific work. In, in modern statistical physics, we have situations which resemble this a little bit, and we have uh, developed strategies how to deal with that, how to deal with the fact that sometimes laws of large numbers cannot be applied. But whether this is sufficient to address these things here, this is, this is a big question. He says, by contrast, a causalities in physics are precisely described by statistical laws. Like, you know, you have brain back to K, which is considered a chance process. Of course, you have a statistical law describing it. And the more events you collect, the better the statistical law, law is, um, is satisfied. So now what he says, this is a kind of um, what's the call. He says, wanted is a type of laws of nature that consists of a correction of chance fluctuations by meaningful or purposeful coincidences of a causally connected events. 
various theories. Which you think. I mean, uh, so he wants a kind of, in other sources, he calls the third type of natural laws beyond purely deterministic and beyond uh, purely statistical laws. And uh, up to today, we really don't know uh, something like that. But I think it's, it's sort of, maybe you can, can grasp what he has in mind and why he has it in mind. Now, the other quotation which I have here is, uh, comes from two years later, 1954. Um, this is a quotation in which he talks about Darwinism. And, and I want to um, show you this quotation because it leads a little bit back to Simmons' model, because, you know, I mentioned to you this is an Armenian model. And Pauli's criticism on Darwinism essentially was that um, nobody, no evolutionary biologist, and he talked to many, uh, could explain to him why evolution can be so fast to, to bring up, for instance, um, something like Homo sapiens in a very short time span. And if it's purely based on chance, like mutate, like random mutations and selection, then um, uh, he always insisted that biologists would give, give him probability estimates for this, uh, for this possibility to emerge in this short time span. And of course, Delbrick and Dry and, and all these guys, Meyer, they, um, they just didn't react in it because they were somehow aware that this, uh, this, these probability estimates are extremely complicated, complicated to derive, but they were pretty sure that Darwinism or neo-Darwinism is correct. So this was Pauli's main concern. And this is the background for this quotation. He says, this model, the Darwinian model of evolution, is an attempt to theoretically cling, according to the ideas of the second half of the 19th century, uh, to the total elimination of any finality, which is something like teleology, go-directedness. As a consequence, this is, has in some way to be replaced by the introduction of chance. That was his very compact historical account of, of what happened when, when Darwin designed his theory. Of course, uh, this appeal to finality or teleology, I think, is a little bit uh, off the point. But uh, I think the main point of his concern is, has in the last three decades or so uh, received a lot of confirmation because uh, we now know that mutations are almost never random. They are, we know now many mechanisms of adaptive mutations to the environment. We know epigenetics. We know that um, uh, phylogenetic changes can be inherited from generation to generation without any change of the genotype. Which was a, one of the major dogmas of the environment. So, this changes the picture, of course, completely, and the role of chance uh, is in some sense diminished because in epigenetics we, we sometimes even know the mechanisms by which these inheritance uh, processes uh, happen. So, this is something um, which should be related to this uh, model which I, which I presented to, to you with the uh, simple chance configuration model. Now here's a brief summary um, in which I want to uh, first address, first repeat what I addressed in this presentation here. Uh, insight, first point, insight due to operations in or on a given problem space. That's something which most people in inside problem solving research are interested in. And of course, there's one um, branch of work which is done uh, purely in terms of cognitive activity. I mentioned that already. This is not the branch which I focused on in this talk. I focused on the other one, in which influences due to something which, which people sometimes call unconscious processing play a role. That's uh, the domain of depth psychology, volume stuff, and so on. And I think, to repeat that, uh, that these frameworks of thinking are, in, in some sense, inspiring and stimulating. I'm not claiming that, uh, they, that they produce any kind of solution right now, but uh, since uh, inside problem solving is an open field without a final resolution, uh, in, in other branches of 
activity as well. It's a, it's a, I think, fair thing to look at competing approaches. Two questions which I have not addressed at all, and which people also in, in scientific research do not address at all. Now, we know cases, for instance, one of the most famous cases is the Indian mathematician Ramanujan. Uh, who's, he solved mathematical problems without really trying to solve the problem. He didn't have the problem. He was just um, producing theorems, you know, one a day or two a day. He produced about 3,000 theorems over a short lifespan of 30 years. And these theorems were just coming out of nowhere. He didn't look for, for solving the problem or something like that, another theory. He just broke them down. And they, he claimed, he often said to um, Hardy, who, who discovered him in India and then um, took him to Oxford, Hardy the mathematician. And he told Hardy that uh, there is no point for him uh, to look for a problem because the family deep, which, which they had back in India, they reviewed the, the solutions to him and he simply wrote them down, nothing else. Now all these 3,000 theorems, uh, which he fixed in his, in his diaries, are now um, over 30 or 40 years um, proven partly with methods which were totally unavailable to Ramanujan at his time, mathematical methods. So this is a complete mystery. Also, Ramanujan was not at all interested in proving the theorems, so the verification issue, he was not interested in it. And, and his, um, the way in which, in which he put it was, you know, I know that they are true because they were revealed by my, by my goddess. So why should I prove that they are true? And this is, of course, a totally different way of thinking. But that's very useful in science. And then the final uh, issue, which I, I did not address, and also an issue which is not addressed in uh, present-day research um, inside of non-scientific nature, something like you know, artistic insight. So this is uh, essentially the end. Here's some references, and let me maybe say one final word. Um, I'm very aware that in, in scientific research, we really have to do small steps and start with uh, the little things and with laboratory work, like, like what I mentioned to you with the batch stick, arithmetic, and so on. But on the other hand, I wanted to, in this talk, one of the first talks in this meeting, also to um, direct your attention to the fact that there are much bigger problems to solve, and uh, this should always be kept in mind when we do our uh, important and necessary day-to-day -day work. Thank you very much for your attention.